In 1265, Italy was a mosaic of city-states, each vying for power, wealth, and influence. The concept of a unified nation was centuries away, and the peninsula was characterized by its regional divisions, with cities like Venice, Milan, and Florence emerging as major centers of commerce and culture. The Papal States, under the direct rule of the Pope, exerted considerable religious and political influence. At the same time, the Kingdom of Sicily in the south presented a different blend of Norman, Byzantine, and Arab heritage. Florence, one of Italy's richest cities, was in the throes of transformation. The city was shaking off the remnants of feudalism and embracing the burgeoning economic model of mercantilism. The guilds, associations of artisans and merchants, were gaining prominence, leading to an increase in political and economic power for the middle class. This shift was creating new wealth and a new social order, setting the stage for the cultural renaissance that was to come. The rivalry between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines marked the political landscape of Florence. The Guelphs supported the papacy, while the Ghibellines favored the Holy Roman Emperor's authority. This rivalry was not just political, it was also a struggle for control of the city's burgeoning wealth. In terms of literature, this period was a time of significant transition. The vernacular, the language spoken by the common people, was beginning to be used in literature, a departure from the traditional Latin that had dominated written texts. This shift made literature more accessible to the burgeoning literate middle class, setting the stage for later Italian works, which would be written in the Tuscan dialect, eventually becoming the basis for the modern Italian language. The lyrical style and themes of chivalric love were being adopted and adapted by Italian poets, leading to the development of the dolce stil novo, or sweet new style. This was a style characterized by its use of metaphor and its focus on love and philosophy as means to understand both earthly and divine nature. Thus, Italy and Florence were at a crossroads of medieval tradition and the early modern world. It was a time of political upheaval, economic growth, and cultural change. The stage was set for a figure like Dante Alighieri to emerge, a figure who would not only reflect the complexities of his time but also transcend them, shaping the course of literature forever. Dante's family, while not among the wealthiest, valued education and culture. His father, Alighiero di Balincin, was a notary, a profession that required literacy and an understanding of law and rhetoric. This background provided Dante with the foundation for his intellectual and literary pursuits. Dante's family was part of the Guelph faction, though not among the most powerful or wealthy. They were minor nobility, involved in the city's complex political fabric, but not at its zenith. The Alighieri family's moderate political involvement and their intellectual leanings were the fertile ground from which Dante's future as a poet and philosopher would grow. It was within this crucible of burgeoning humanism and political strife that Dante Alighieri was born, in May of 1265, to a family of minor nobility. Dante's early life was set against the backdrop of Florence's golden age. The young Dante showed an early proclivity for the arts and learning. He was immersed in the classics of the time, drawing from a well of knowledge that included Roman authors such as Virgil and Cicero, and contemporaneous works in the vernacular. His education was not confined to the literary. He was also instructed in the ways of love and chivalry, which were the fabric of courtly life and would later permeate his most famous works. A pivotal moment in Dante's youth, one that would etch itself into the annals of literary history, was his encounter with Beatrice Portinari. Though their meetings were fleeting and their interaction minimal, Beatrice would become the muse for Dante's La Vita Nuova and, more famously, the embodiment of divine love in the Divine Comedy. This idealized love was a cornerstone of the Dolce Stil Novo, and it was through this lens that Dante viewed his Beatrice, elevating her to a near celestial status in his works. Dante's formative years were also marred by loss and grief. His mother, Bella, passed away when he was a young boy, and his father followed when Dante was a teenager. These personal tragedies thrust him into early adulthood, laden with responsibilities. He took up the study of rhetoric and philosophy, attending the schools of religious orders, such as the Franciscans and Dominicans, which further honed his intellectual prowess. The young poet, 
whose soul was already steeped in the love of Beatrice and the philosophies of ancient and contemporary scholars, found himself navigating the treacherous waters of Florentine politics and familial responsibilities. In 1285, Dante's life took a decisive turn. He married Gemma Donati, a union that was more a product of social convention and political alliance than of the courtly love he so ardently wrote about. Gemma, related to the powerful Donati family, brought stability and social standing, but little is known of their personal rapport. Together, they had several children, and Dante, the contemplative poet, was also Dante, the family man, striving to provide for his household in an era when political affiliation often dictated personal fortune. Dante's involvement in the political life of Florence was both a calling and a necessity. He held several public offices, a testament to his standing in the community and his intellectual acumen. However, the Florence that Dante served was a city divided. The strife between the black and white Guelphs had intensified, and Dante found himself increasingly in opposition to the more extreme elements of the black faction, which was gaining dominance. The political climate of Florence was unforgiving, and Dante's fortunes were inextricably linked to the ebb and flow of power. In 1301, while on a diplomatic mission to Rome, Dante received word that he had been accused of corruption and, without a chance to defend himself, was sentenced to exile. This decree was not just a banishment from the city but a stripping away of his assets and his means to support his family. Exile was a crucible that tested Dante's resolve and sharpened his pen. As he wandered from city to city, he found himself distanced from his wife and children, who remained in Florence, likely under the protection of Gemma's family. The poet, who had once navigated the corridors of power in Florence, now relied on the patronage of other nobles sympathetic to his cause or enamored of his intellect. It was during these years of separation and itinerancy that Dante poured his soul into his magnum opus, The Divine Comedy. In the realm of literary masterpieces, Dante Alighieri's work stands as a monumental achievement, not merely for its poetic brilliance but for its comprehensive portrayal of medieval worldviews. This epic poem is an allegorical narrative that guides readers through the Christian afterlife, hell, purgatory, and paradise. The Divine Comedy begins on the eve of Good Friday in the year 1300, with Dante himself as the protagonist. At the age of 35, halfway through the biblical lifespan of 70 years, he finds himself lost in a dark wood, symbolizing sin and confusion. It is here that he encounters the spirit of the ancient Roman poet Virgil, who becomes his guide through Inferno and Purgatorio. Virgil, representing human reason, is a fitting guide through these realms but cannot accompany Dante into Paradiso, which requires divine revelation. In Inferno, Dante and Virgil traverse the nine circles of hell, each housing souls punished in a manner befitting their sins, a concept known as contrapasso. The vivid and often gruesome punishments that Dante imagines for the various sinners are a reflection of his own moral compass and his views on justice. The journey through hell is not just a tour of torment, but a deeply personal exploration of human weakness and the consequences of our actions. Purgatorio, the mountainous island where souls undergo purification, presents a stark contrast to the despair of Inferno. Here, the penitent spirits endure suffering to cleanse themselves of their sins, allowing them to ascend to Paradiso. Dante's ascent up the mountain is as much a spiritual awakening as it is a physical journey reflecting his belief in the possibility of redemption and growth. Paradiso, the sphere of divine light, is where Dante, now guided by his celestial love Beatrice, explores the heavenly cosmos. The souls here are arranged in a series of concentric spheres that reflect their closeness to God. In this realm, Dante encounters various saints and theologians, engaging in complex theological discussions. The culmination of this journey is Dante's vision of the Empyrean, the abode of God, and the profound realization of divine love and light. The Divine Comedy is not merely a religious or didactic work, it is also a political commentary. Dante populates his afterlife with figures from his own time, including popes and rulers, some of whom are consigned to hell for their corruption and misdeeds. The poem reflects Dante's disdain for the political turmoil and moral decay he perceived in his society. 
The structure of the poem is a marvel of numerological symbolism. Composed in terza rima, a rhyme scheme of ABA, BCB, CDC, and so on, the poem's verses flow with a rhythmic precision that mirrors the order of the universe Dante sought to represent. The number three, significant in Christian symbolism for the Trinity, permeates the work, three books, each consisting of 33 cantos, except Inferno, which has 34, one being the introduction, and lines grouped in sets of three. Dante Alighieri's life after the completion of the Divine Comedy was as poignant and profound as the journey depicted in his magnum opus. The last canto of Paradiso was completed in 1320, a year before his death. Dante's final days were spent under the patronage of Guido Novello de Polenta, the Lord of Ravenna, a city that provided him with the peace and stability that had eluded him for so long in his exile. The completion of the Divine Comedy did not bring Dante the immediate acclaim we might expect. The work was a culmination of his life's theological, philosophical, and poetic explorations, yet its reception was initially limited to a relatively small circle of scholars and patrons. Dante himself would not live to see the widespread impact of his work, which would only be fully recognized posthumously. In Ravenna, Dante continued to engage in scholarly and diplomatic activities. His reputation as a thinker and writer of unparalleled depth afforded him respect, but it was a respect tinged with the melancholy of a man who had lost his homeland. Florence remained an unreachable dream, its memories both sweet and bitter, shaping the exile's final reflections and writings. Dante's health began to wane as he approached his 56th year. It is said that he contracted malaria during one of his diplomatic missions to Venice, a city-state that, like Florence, was a hub of commerce and intrigue. The illness would ultimately lead to his death in 1321, leaving the Divine Comedy as his final testament. The narrative that Dante did not finish the Divine Comedy is a misconception. The poem was complete, but its final cantos were not immediately known to his contemporaries in Ravenna. According to legend, Dante's sons, Jacopo and Pietro, both poets themselves, were instrumental in locating the final portion of the manuscript. As the story goes, Dante appeared to Jacopo in a dream, revealing the hidden location of the last 13 cantos of Paradiso. Whether this tale is apocryphal or not, it speaks to the aura of mystery and reverence that surrounds Dante's legacy. In passing, Dante Alighieri left behind more than just his famed divine comedy. He became a guiding star for poets and writers everywhere. His journey through the realms of the afterlife didn't just capture the imagination of his Italian peers but also resonated across borders, influencing writers around the world. Dante's ability to weave his struggles with universal truths made him a master storyteller, one whose work continues to teach and inspire. His legacy is a reminder of how stories can deeply touch us all, bridging time and place, and how a single voice can echo through the ages, urging us to think, feel, and aspire to greater heights.